Seneca letter meaning after coronavirus number two. So in this video, we're going to unravel what Seneca's talking about in his second letter to Lucilius. This is the everywhere is nowhere letter, and it's time to chuck deuces with the father of modern stoicism. What up, fam? Dr. James W. Stalko, a.k.a. Jimmy Joe Coltrane. Yeah, Epictetus was probably the father of modern stoicism, but it was a catchy thing to say. So as a Stoic, the meaning of Seneca's letters are very important to me, and I'm going back and rereading these after coronavirus. And I'm going to tell you what, it hits a lot different. And look, I'm not getting into like the etymology and the semantics of the Greek words. I'm just trying, like you as a Stoic, to figure these things out. And real quick, if you don't know who Seneca was, he's one of the greats of Stoic philosophy. And three years prior to his death, he started writing letters to his friend Lucilius. And he's going to open this letter by making a parallel between traveling a lot and reading multiple authors. One of the odd things about this letter is he starts off by saying people who travel a lot are unsettled. Now he's making that statement as a comparison to people who read multiple philosophers. But this letter is kind of odd because he starts cascading justifications for the comparison. So he literally is making an argument and then justifying the argument, but the argument is just a comparison. So watch what he says. And I'm going to read this verbatim. Everywhere means nowhere. When a person spends all of his time in foreign travel, he ends by having many acquaintances, but no friends. So, okay, we got that, Seneca. People who bounce around from place to place probably don't have the same closeness of friendship that you have with your friends. And I think Seneca was kind of like all over, but okay. And the same thing must hold true of men who seek intimate acquaintance with no single author, but visit them all in a hasty and hurried manner. Okay, I see where you're going with this. You're saying like casual knowledge of a philosophy or casual knowledge of what an author is trying to tell you does not really give you a perception of their entire body of work. Or I guess you're saying that maybe that doesn't cement the concepts in well enough. You know, Seneca was real big on repetition and repetitive study, and so I think we're going to see this unfold in this letter. And here comes the avalanche of Seneca giving you a liturgy of, of sort of analogies on why this is the case. Food does no good and is not assimilated into the body if it leaves the stomach as soon as it's eaten. Actually, most of the nutrients are recovered in the, uh, the small bowel and the large intestine, but we'll give Seneca a break on that one. Nothing hinders a cure as much as a frequent change in medicine. No wound will heal when one salve is tried after another. So this is just, I mean, he's just laying it on just one after another. A plant which is often moved can never grow strong and in reading of many books is distraction. So now we get to the, we're getting into the meat of what he's saying. So what Seneca is doing is he is advocating a curriculum, like a single curriculum. Accordingly, since you cannot read all the books which you may possess, it is enough to possess only as many books as you can read. But, you reply, I wish to dip first into one book and then into another. I tell you that it is the sign of an overnice appetite to toy with many dishes, for when they are manifold and varied, they cloy but do not nourish. So you should always read standard authors, and when you crave a change, fall back upon those whom you read before. So here's where I think he's going with this. First off, I'm not sure about the term standard authors. I don't know if that may mean accepted or people who are accepted as being the greats. But what Seneca is saying is your philosophy in life should be unwavering. You shouldn't you think about it like a diet. Like I know people who go from one fad diet to another fad diet to another fad diet. And this has actually been researched in medicine. Fad diets don't really work. It turns out the diet that is going to work the best for you is the one that you are able to adhere to. And Seneca is sort of talking about this philosophical diet, how you have as much as you can read. And when you crave variety, you go back and repeat the points that you have read before. You read those books again. We all probably know people in our lives who sort of change from one philosophy to another. 
toxic positivity is the big one now. You know, people grasp this toxic positivity and they'll run with it for a couple of years and make a few thousand Facebook posts, a few thousand Instagram posts, and then one day they wake up and realize it doesn't work. It's a weird sort of underperforming support group. Like, I'll click like on your description of your weaknesses so you can click like on my description of my weaknesses and none of us can ever change, but we can just roll around in that positivity. And you do see this on the internet. It almost changes with catchphrases, right? Like there is a vernacular that, that grows up surrounding something and you see these, and then in you know, a couple months, there's another new vernacular that pops up. Each day acquire something that will fortify you against poverty, against death, indeed against other misfortunes as well. And after you've run over many thoughts, select one to be thoroughly digested that day. Now, of course, when Seneca says fortify yourself against death, he doesn't mean actually try to prevent death, for death is to be accepted. He just means fortify yourself, fortify your emotions, prepare yourself for that death. And this is something that as a Stoic I've questioned. Should you meditate on your mortality daily? So when I've meditated on mortality daily, it seems to have not been as effective as if once every three days I take an intense, this is my last day on this earth, I will die tonight. And that sort of mantra to myself seems to bring it into focus, but it's very hard for me to do that every day. Perhaps as we practice our philosophy, we should take one point to solidify every day. So like today might be my sphere of influence. Tomorrow might be uh, political beliefs. The next day might be meditating on mortality. And that's kind of the great thing about stoicism because it's so easy. You can do repetition in this. Now, also, let's not overlook the fact that there were a whole lot of different schools of philosophy, and even amongst the major philosophical kind of tenets uh, back in this day, uh, even though Stoicism had a very, very large following, there were a lot of philosophies that may have had subgenres that we don't even know, that we're not even aware of. Like, we know the mainstream stuff, but there could have been very popular local channels, so to speak. And so maybe Seneca was saying read standard authors because there was like this disbursement of these sort of minor schools of philosophical thought. And remember, this was in the time of Nero, but the Roman Empire was going to extend past Nero for quite some time. That's not to say that there weren't a lot of problems, but it's not like Rome is falling to the Gauls at this very moment. So then Seneca's got this beef with Epicurus, and I don't know what this beef is, but boy, he dogs him sometimes. And so he's going to take a little dig at Epicurus and quote him. And this is sort of interesting because Seneca does seem like a real person to me. Like in these letters, Seneca seems like a real person. Like he's going to quote Epicurus, but he's got so much ego that he won't quote him without actually taking a dig at him. So here's the actual language. The thought for today is one which I discovered in Epicurus, for I am wont to cross over even into the enemy's camp, not as a deserter, but as a scout. So he's basically saying, I'm not deserting my beliefs and going to Epicureanism, but I'm going to just poke my head in there and sneak in the enemy's camp and see what they're talking about. So now you feel like this is kind of building up. Okay, we have this thread that's progressing. We're making analogies. And now Seneca is going to entirely shift gears. He's going to go from first gear to fourth gear and get on a completely unrelated topic. This may have to do with mail in the ancient world. So I think what happened was you had to kind of get all your thoughts in that letter because it probably wasn't easy just to mail a letter every day and have it sent to someone. So sometimes when we see this gear shift in these letters, we're like, well, you know, why wouldn't you just text him that later? Well, there's no text message, right? Like, it's very hard to get a letter across town. The gear shift is into the topic of contented poverty, which for me is just a fascinating, fascinating part of Seneca's thoughts. Contented poverty is an honorable estate. Contented poverty, the overcoming the innate desire to want more and more and more, looking at that hedonic treadmill and saying, yo, I'm not going to walk on that thing. That was considered very, very honorable the big criticisms of American society right now is every person thinks that they're an emperor and they just happen not to have an empire at this very moment. I read that somewhere and I thought that that's very appropriate. There's not much contented poverty that goes on in America. Not only that, we have highly addictive phone apps that are basically telling us that we can't be content. So real quick, if you like this content, I, I saw content and I thought about content, click like and click subscribe. This is a brand new channel. I'm uploading two videos a week. I don't want you to miss anything. 
But back to contented poverty. Indeed, if it be contented, it is not poverty at all. It is not the man who has too little, but the man who craves more that is poor. Now think about this for a second. It is not the man who has too little, but the man who craves more who is poor. So a big part of Stoic philosophy is kind of that mind over matter, being able to suppress and overcome your desire to want more. What does it matter how much a man has laid up in his safe, in his warehouse, how large are his flocks, how fat are his dividends, if he covets his neighbor's property and reckons not on his past gains, but his hopes of gains to come? Do you ask what is the proper limit to wealth? It is first to have what is necessary and second to have what is enough. So you take three great Stoics, Epictetus, Seneca, and Marcus Aurelius. If you had to do a top three, it's hard for me to believe that most people wouldn't lump those people into the top three. Marcus Aurelius, when he lives, most powerful man in the world. Seneca, one of the richest men in all of Greece, and Epictetus, a slave, yet all shared the same philosophy. We are bound in this mortal form to live by comparison. And comparison is the thief of joy. And if we are to meditate on something today, perhaps meditation should be on the fact that we most likely have enough, but we don't look at it that way. Thanks for watching.